Without this card, gaming as we know it today wouldn't exist. That's a bold statement to make about any consumer product, but especially one from a company that no longer exists. Here's the thing though, I don't think it's a hard sell at all. PC gaming in the 90s was evolving at an incredible pace, and this card, today's entry on the Department of Rendering, formed a one-two punch of computer hardware that only catalyzed and accelerated that change. This card, and the chipset that powers it, single-handedly cemented the PC as the ultimate gaming platform. This was THE card to have in 1996. But where did it all start? And how do you even review a legend? Especially with 30 years of hindsight. Well, hopefully I can do the card and your memories some justice. This is the 3DFX Voodoo Graphics. Let's dive in. Officially, 3DFX was founded in 1994, but the idea to bring workstation-quality 3D graphics to the PC had first formed in early 1992 in the form of Pellucid Technologies, where some of the team attempted to resell a high-end workstation 3D board by Silicon Graphics called the Iris Vision. This venture collapsed, and Pellucid was eventually bought by Media Vision, makers of the Pro Audio Spectrum sound card, among other things. But by the time 1994 rolled around, the crew had a much clearer vision of what they wanted to do. Games. The Pellucid disaster had taught them that hardware was useless without things to run on it, and in the early 90s, 3D graphics were burning through the arcade scene like a wildfire. And at first, the costs of memory and chip manufacturing suggested to the team that a games-focused 3D board would land around the $1,000 price point, and so it would make more sense to sell to arcade equipment manufacturers since, you know, asking consumers to put a $1,000 3D-only expansion card in their PC to play games was at the time considered ridiculous. The RTX 3090 Ti. But before long, the price of memory fell dramatically enough that they realized they could do both, and indeed would need to do both. The consumer boards would end up being around $300, and the arcade vendors would legitimize them as a new card manufacturer and get people to buy their product. It seemed like the perfect plan. Before we get too far into the weeds here, I think it's important to understand who the four founders of 3DFX were. These weren't just some random guys from SGI. For most of this video, I'll be referencing the excellent 3DFX oral history interview conducted in 2013 by the Computer History Museum, uh, link in the description. I highly recommend giving it a watch if you're interested in the early days of the company and the founders' thoughts behind how they did and why they did what they did. Anyway, onwards. 3DFX was founded by Gary Taroli, Scott Sellers, Ross Smith, and Gordon Campbell. Gary Taroli was the software guy. While at SGI, he ported IrisGL to a software reference implementation. This seems perfectly normal these days, but back then, IrisGL was used exclusively to control and program SGI's high-end graphics boards, so a software implementation didn't immediately really make any sense. However, this software IrisGL implementation would eventually become OpenGL, which of course would later evolve into Vulkan, so I guess we have Gary to thank for that. Scott Sellers was the hardware guy. He's the reason the early Voodoo cards could do things other 3D accelerators at the time seemingly couldn't. It was his idea to use two chips instead of one to double the number of transistors and memory channels available to the accelerator, and he implemented the high bandwidth protocol that enabled the two chips of the Voodoo Graphics and the three chips of the Voodoo 2 to work seamlessly together as a unified chipset. His aggressive memory interleaving routines meant that the Voodoo could perform high-quality bilinear texture filtering for effectively zero performance cost, which is absolutely not something you could say about the Voodoo's competitors at the time. Ross Smith worked in defense before joining MIPS and building workstations with them. MIPS got folded into SGI, and Ross eventually started doing the same thing at SGI. While at 3DFX, he finally ended up heading up the spin-off Quantum 3D, where he built and sold ultra-high-end voodoo boards for flight simulators, trainers, and high-end visualization workstations. Finally, Gordon Campbell. By the time he got involved with the 3DFX boys, he'd been a several-time successful serial entrepreneur, with Seek Technologies and Chips and Tech? under his belt already. Yes, that chips and tech. He had experience in fabless manufacturing, and he had the industry connections at TSMC that the rest of the team would need to bring their baby to market. Together, these four made up a veritable silicon manufacturing dream team. 
So it was no accident then that their first product was such a runaway success, right? I'm paraphrasing here, but the development pattern that Gary and Scott described in the interview was one of, as Scott describes it, Gary brings me an algorithm that'll give us a feature, and now I need to figure out how to implement it in silicon so that it happens every clock cycle without fail, and also doesn't take up half the die area. And it was through this back and forth, iterative design process, then the two of them figured out how to give the original Voodoo all the features it would need to produce compelling, high-performance gaming visuals. And it wasn't by sheer luck they were able to deliver this working silicon with so much innovative technology on board. Uh, Gary had programmed a simulator that could emulate the original Voodoo at the clock level to make sure that Scott's implementation could deliver the needed performance on time, every pixel. The stars aligned in 1995. The first tape-out worked immediately, and the Voodoo was born. So just to give you an idea of the level of insanity of this timeline, right? The original PlayStation launched in North America, September 1995. 3DFX showed off their silicon at Comdex in December of 1995. Quake 1 was released for DOS in July of 1996. The N64 launched in September of 1996. And the first Voodoo boards were shipping by October 1996. It was a heck of a year for 3D gaming. So let's say you got a Voodoo card for Christmas 96. What were you playing on it in the winter and spring of 97? Well, basically whatever you wanted. The entire PC games industry seemed to pivot overnight to producing Voodoo exclusive ports of existing games or promising Voodoo support for upcoming titles, either as a launch feature or as a later patch. The PC, which was up to this point a nerdy little footnote in gaming history, was instantly thrust to the forefront of the skyrocketing home video game industry. 3DFX offered a card you could drop into basically any PC that was able to push more polygons than the PlayStation, produce higher quality visuals than the N64, and it outran all of its nearest competitors by wide margins. The Voodoo was twice as fast as its next fastest rival, the Rendition V1000, and four times faster than the market leader at the time by volume, S3's Verge. And of course, it single-handedly buried NVIDIA's quirky quad-based NV1 accelerator, forcing them to go back to the drawing board for their next product. When people like me call it a legendary 3D card, this is what we're talking about. Anyway, enough chat. Let's see these cutting-edge 3D games you were running on a Voodoo back in the day. It's no secret that 3D accelerated DOS games were the Voodoo's bread and butter early on. Heck, Direct 3D didn't even launch until the Voodoo came out in September 96, and DirectX 5, the version that the Voodoo's most commonly associated with, didn't launch until Windows 98 did in July of 1998. Arguably the most famous of these early Voodoo-enabled DOS games was Tomb Raider, which launched on Sega Saturn, MS-DOS, and PlayStation in the fall of 96. 3D effects support arrived a few months later, with this one-level demo here shipping with the Diamond Monster 3D in November 96, and a beta patch for the full version of the game releasing around December the same year. The Tomb Raider, of course, was the number one selling game on the PlayStation, and its influence on 3D adventure games cannot be understated. Now, the Voodoo's game library wasn't just console ports. Original DOS games were also developed with 3DFX support, such as this, Screamer Rally, from 1997. This is the follow-on to Screamer 2, and shipped with Voodoo support in pure DOS, enabling smooth frame rates and an unprecedented sense of speed. Early hardware-accelerated Windows games also saw success in the Voodoo, such as this game, Incoming an alpha-blending heavy arcade shooter from 1998 that saw a brief inclusion in the benchmark charts and the gaming websites of the day. Later PlayStation ports, of course, ran nicely on the original Voodoo as well, like this game, which is Roll Cage, a Cygnosis combat racer in the vein of Wipeout, released in 1999. But of course, 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the 800 pound gorilla in the room. The whole reason 3DFX saw the amount of success that it did. GL Quake. It looks positively primitive these days, but the OpenGL port of Quake, with the 3DFX tuned mini GL enabler library, took the PC first-person shooter world by storm in early 1997. By the end of the year, Quake 2 would ship, with support for the Voodoo built in from day one, and of course the upgrade of vibrant pre-baked colored lighting in Quake 2's hardware accelerated modes was enough for many enthusiasts to take the plunge and get one of these legendary graphics cards. As revolutionary as the Voodoo was, with the release of the Voodoo 2 in 1998 and the Voodoo 3 in 1999, it faded from relevance pretty quickly, but that didn't mean you couldn't play newer games on it, they just might not run super great. Unreal Tournament here, for example, released in 1999, runs pretty well on the Voodoo All Things Considered, and although those frame drops can be lethal sometimes, it's still an impressive showing for the single pipeline 50 MHz 3D accelerator. It's a similar story with Quake 3 Arena, also released in 1999. Turning its multi-texturing support off takes a real load off the humble Voodoo and allows it to reach nearly competitive frame rates. Well, almost. So, um, about that performance, let's run some benchmarks. The test system today is the ultimate 1998 gaming PC I built on stream a couple of months back. A 450MHz Pentium 2 on a 440BX motherboard from Gateway, and 128 megs of RAM. The 2D card here is a Reva 128, and of course my Voodoo graphics card is the Diamond Monster 3D, the 4MB version, running slightly overclocked at 57MHz. Starting off with Expendable here at 640x480 and 512x384, the Voodoo turns in an impressive 32.8 frames per second at its highest resolution, considering that this benchmark was well known for punishing cards well into the GeForce era. Up next is the classic Unreal Castle Flyby, running in Glide at 512x384 and 640x480. Unreal makes very heavy use of multi-texturing to present its lighting as baked light maps, and the single texture mapping unit of the Voodoo really struggles here, returning just 22 FPS at 640x480. And of course, Unreal also had a really pretty competent software renderer, so like, you weren't even gaining much in the way of eye candy with the Voodoo one. Bummer. Up next is Forsaken, which is a pretty easy to run direct 3D title, utilizing mostly vertex lights and some alpha blending effects. As such, the Voodoo does great here, turning in 62 FPS in the built-in Nuke benchmark at 640x480. Nicely done. Last but not least are the Quakes, GL Quake and Quake 2. GL Quake returns a smooth but not quite silky smooth 43 FPS at 640x480, while Quake 2 needs to be dropped to 512x384 to return similar frame rates. Quake 2's software render is about the same speed on this Pentium 2, which makes sense. This is way too much CPU for the little voodoo. So what's the conclusion? The Voodoo Graphics wasn't a fluke, or a lucky bet. It was the culmination of several years of work by Silicon Valley veterans. They knew what they needed to make, they knew how to build it, test it, fab it, and market it, and it did well in the marketplace. The 3DFX Voodoo was honestly just a good idea, really well executed. Its SST chipset did things no one else was able to do at the time, thanks to clever hacks and a deep knowledge of both the problem domain of real-time 3D graphics and the limitations of consumer electronics at the time. Fun fact, SST, the name of the Voodoo chipset, stands for Sellers, Smith, and Turoli. The more you know. That being said, it was pretty quickly rendered obsolete by the ridiculous pace of technology in the 90s. The Revo 128 launched in 1997 and doubled the Voodoo's performance on paper, 
and 3DFX's own follow-up, The Voodoo 2 in 1998, quadrupled the original chipset's texturing capabilities. Still, I think it's pretty safe to say that PC gaming wouldn't be in the position it's currently in today without the Voodoo and without 3DFX. It probably would have gotten there eventually, but I think we'd all be reminiscing over renditions V3000 and V4000 cards today, rather than waxing poetic about how well Voodoos play Quake games. It's an interesting thing to think about. Hello! You've been watching the Department of Rendering here on Tech Ambrosia. My name is Amber, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode about the original 3D effects Voodoo graphics. If you did, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. It really helps in my fight against the algorithm. If you had one of these cards, or wished you had one of them, please leave a comment below. Or I guess to the right, if you got the new layout? No matter what, I love to hear your experiences with the hardware I talk about on the show. My first Voodoo card was actually a Voodoo Banshee. I never had the Voodoo 1 or the Voodoo 2 back in the day. I recently acquired the same model Banshee I had back in 1998, so we'll probably take a look at it in a future episode. So stay tuned for that. For now, though, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and as always, may the PC parts be ever in your favor. Have a great night.